<laughs> uh, we're out there. <laughs> You're looking well. Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, the miracle of uh, <laughs> of uh, modern cameras. <laughs> <laughs> you can apply filters. Uh, I don't think there's any filter that can make me look good, to be honest. <laughs> Well, you look wonderful. And oh, cheers. thank you, Darren Templeman, for joining the chat today. It's so great to have you here. And I'm going to have you all to myself for the next hour. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I don't even know where to start. I've just come off the <laughs> Are You OK webinar and it was just um, dealing with anxiety at the moment is very different, isn't it? You, you kind yeah. of, you know, you... Normally we just can deal with it, but I don't know. Absolutely, the there's so many, yeah, so many things happening, so many different tangents happening within the industry right now. You know, there's some people that are still uh, plugging away, some people doing the takeaway and the home deliveries, and yeah, there's so many things happening out there. It's just it's so confusing as well for you know for the new guys coming into the industry. It's like, what the hell is happening? What's going on here? Yeah, it's, it's a it's tough, confusing tough call. Even for those that have been in the industry forever, like yeah, it, it's um. Everyone has their own journey at the moment. Mm -hmm. Very much. Yeah, for sure. Everyone's, everyone's got their own story to tell and they're all going through very different. Um, but the, yeah, but the camaraderie is so strong. So it is, strong. Isn't and that's it? what I'm yeah, really finding. Everyone's sticking together. It's so good to see. Oh, I agree. It's, it's really wonderful to see how everyone's supporting each other at the moment. And yeah. all you have to do is ask. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely which is the beauty of it you know everyone's there we're so so connected it's just fantastic you know not just like uh, other chefs or other restaurants so all coming together but suppliers everyone's just like you know, really jumped on board to help everyone out and it's just beautiful to see it is it really is i totally agree with you so how are you going how's everything going no, i'm really good you know we're just um yeah waiting for the new restaurant to open up um, yeah, that's been delayed, obviously, with lockdown and with the tradies not being able to come out to work on the, on the site because of the, the, the LGAs that are, you know, even stricter and forced now as a, a lockdown. So, yeah, it's all taken a bit of time and we're hoping to get there, you know, end of the year. So, yeah, we'll see what happens. And you're, you come from the UK, obviously. Uh -huh. And Is it still yeah. obvious? <laughs> It's not as obvious anymore as what it used to be. You, you've yeah. really got the whole Aussie twang happening now. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> when, when you go back home and you see your family, do they say, oh, you're an Aussie now? Yeah, it's funny because when I speak to people on the phone, I've not been home for 21 years. I've been out here 21 really? years now and not been back here, not once. Obviously, you know, life is busy running the restaurant, having a family. You know, life just moves really fast. So, yeah, it's, I'd rather have my family come out here, have a great time, have a holiday, see a bit of sunshine, which is what you don't see in the UK for sure. And yeah, have, yeah, it's a, it's a lot nicer to come out here than to go back. So yeah, when I speak to them on the phone, they always say, yeah, I sound proper Aussie. But when I speak to other people out here, they say, oh, you haven't lost your accent. I'm like, I don't know. I'm, that's in between. I can't hear anything different. But yeah. When you have a few drinks, does it get stronger? Which one? <laughs> your, your, your English accent. Yeah, my, my English accent comes out more pronounced when I've had a, a couple of beers, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I love it when I go out and I'm, I'm with the guys from Ireland and uh -huh. the more drinks they have, the, oh, yeah. the, the more I just start nodding my head. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Sure to be sure. Saying, you're, a, you're, you're an idiot, Vanessa, and all this, and I'm just like... <laughs> yeah, 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 thank you. <laughs> I'll have one, please. Yeah, cheers. <laughs> I yeah. actually can't believe you haven't been home for 21 years. No, look, end of the day, you know, when you come out here, you, know, you start a new life. If you keep flopping back and forwards, I see a lot of other chefs have done this. They've gone back for a year, come out for a year. You don't any, you don't have any sort of like a continu uh, continuity. No, uh, yeah, you don't have... You come out here, you make a life. Yeah, you, you get a... You, know, you get a business, you get a career, you get a family, and that's what you do. If you keep flip flopping around, you don't have that sort of like, you know, that direction to be working in the right direction as such. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't miss going home for sure. But you know, I love it out here. Otherwise, twenty one years, a long time. Sunshine, it is. yeah, 
even even now okay last week beautiful spring i know gorgeous today it started off nice now it's like a i don't know just (laughs) nowhere it's just like this gloomy (laughs) horrible like gray day now it's like wow it's like Melbourne in one day. We've got all the different seasons. Yeah, it's a bit grey now, but it's still it's still nice. I'm still it sat here nice. in shorts and t-shirt and uh, casual, <laughs> super casual. Hey, how did you handle when you came out to Australia from the UK and you have got the heat and you've got the sunshine and you guys are kind of renowned for yeah. being quite pale? Yeah, I, I still am. <laughs> uh, Working in kitchens, you don't see a lot of sunshine in the kitchen, so I still have that uh, that kitchen tan, that nice whiteness about me. <laughs> um, yeah, when I first got off the plane, I spent a little bit of time in Singapore and uh, Bahrain on the flight over, and so tried to get used to a bit of the heat, which was quite nice. It wasn't too hot, but it was quite nice. Then I got off here, my first day um, was in October. I think it was um, it was. Uh, a public holiday and it was 42 degrees oh wow it was like it's unbelievably <laughs> hot and i was just and i had no t-shirts no shorts no nothing i had all my english clothes with me still and i was just like oh my god i'm not going to survive this but luckily it's not 42 degrees every day so it was good and you're yeah. resilient and you're strong yeah well yeah it have to be in it to work in the in hospitality yeah, you do, you do. But you know what? We're built for that. Absolutely, yeah. So, Mentally so as tell well. me, Darren, about your journey. How did you get into cooking in the first place? What connected you to food? Oh, right. So uh, going back, um, my, my upbringing in the UK, I was brought up in a council estate in the 80s, well, 70s, 80s. And, you know, my mum was a good cook, but, you know, money wasn't, wasn't flash. We never had a lot of money. Um, so mum had to make do with, with what she had, basically. Um, so we had a lot of waffle. You know, we, we'd have a, like a, a takeaway once a month or something, which was the luxury or, you know, it, it was very simplistic food, but, but tasty and delicious. And the highlight of the week was always the, the Sunday roast, which was, you know, amazing, you know, roast beef or roast chicken or a capon. Um, and then mum would be baking all day as well, with bake all tarts. And that, that whole experience of you know having that house filled with that beautiful flavors was just fantastic and my mom was a school dinner lady as well where i am where i used to go to school so i saw my mom all day <laughs> i saw my mom all 24 hours a day basically and so my mom has a, a huge uh, um reason why i'm a, I'm a cook for sure yeah That's and that was, uh, yeah absolutely it was mom was a good cook my grand was a good cook you know, my ground, you know, because obviously that generation after the war, you know, they had nothing, you know, they had like um, the ration packages and stuff. So going into the 70s and 80s, they, that, was, that was luxury for them, you know. But looking back, it was completely different to where we are today, you know. Uh, you know my, my ground was always cooking like tripe, which, you know, we boiling away on the stove for hours, you know. Do you like, just like tripe? Um, I, I can tolerate it. Not massive, yeah, but I can tolerate it. Yeah, it depends. It's what you used to, isn't it? I can't yeah. do awful. I love, I, as a chef, one of my favourite things to cook was always awful. And uh-huh. yet I would, I just can't eat it. Oh, I love it. Kidneys, liver, any animal, yeah. I don't mind. <laughs> I actually days. love pate, so that's that's mm. that's sort of yeah. kind of. <laughs> that's your entry level. <laughs> and yeah. taken by the butter and the cream. 100%. <laughs> so you, so you, your mum obviously inspired you. So tell me, what was your favourite? Was the English fish and chips your favourite or the roast? Um, oh, the roast, the Sunday roast. So many components to get right at the right time. I mean, we all, we all grew up with, uh, you know, the, the Brussels sprouts that were cooked to like the... <laughs> it's almost like spherification. Yeah, you could just touch it and they dissolve. Um, but yeah, mum, mum did well. She, yeah, looking back, you know, it was probably hard. You know, I was fussy. My sister was fussy. My dad was fussy. You know, we were all fuss pots sat around the table. And she had to please all of us. So she did well, yeah, for sure. <laughs> That's what mums do, though, isn't it, right? And yeah. dads. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And like, I always think back to like um, special occasions. It's like the trifle would come out. Mum's special sherry trifle, <laughs> you know? And it was just so good, so good. 
That is so good. So does any of the cooking from your mum inspire any of the choices that you put on your menus? Um, no, but it's about the enjoyment factor. When you sit down to the table and have a, having a good plate of food, great company, that's the, that's the enjoyment factor that I try to, to bring to the restaurants. Um, at the end of the day, it's, it's not just about the food, it's about the people on the table. So if you can give the, you know, the X factor onto the plate, then happy days. Yeah, it absolutely is. So, so take me back to your first job. Where, where, where did you start and how did it all start? Okay, so there's a, a, a one star. It already star. sounds like there's a story in yeah. this. Yeah, there's a story. Yeah, there's, a, there's always a story somewhere. <laughs> um, so Maggie Thatcher was, you know, she was running um, you know, England into the ground at the time. And the high unemployment so to try to get the all the kids off the street and stuff she started a, a youth, youth training scheme the yts and it was 28 pound 50 a week and for 28 pound 50 a week you do 40 hours and you go one day to tafe which was the college of further education in the uk so you go there you, you work for your five days at the restaurant and you go to school and you have one day off and you know you get your trade so i was like okay Let's go. Uh, and I started off in a, in a one-star restaurant uh, called Shay Nu. Um, fantastic. Very small. Tiny, uh, tiny kitchen. Um, there was two of us. And we actually worked in a cage <laughs> at the back of the restaurant. And we were literally outside. I mean, OH&S would have an absolute field day with it now. But um, you know, we were like you know, two apprentices or, or commies. We just like there, you know, Deveining sweetbreads and cleaning, you know, poking bone marrow out of you know, it was just all all crazy stuff outside. He had to go through this process before he could get into the main kitchen, which was you really know, a, a rite of passage. Yeah, yeah, interesting times. You know, back in this is 80, 86. Yeah, wow, yeah. that was about Sounds, that yeah. was just before I started my apprenticeship. So, what were you like at school? Um usual kid and uh, you know just nothing special um probably more interested in football and and in girls in, in music <laughs> so yeah school wise you know i didn't i didn't shine in, in any form or fashion but uh, yeah yeah and and it was what you, it was did you you went to year 10 mm -hmm. like yeah. our equivalent of year 10 uh yeah which was um in the uk it's was fifth form and because I was the youngest in my year, I left school at just over 15, 15 and a half. Okay. And I went and I went back to take my my CSEs, uh, which is like your your standard HSE, basically, I think. Um, and yeah, and I went straight into the workforce at 15 and a half, 16. So did you stay in the one place your entire apprenticeship? Um, no. Um, I moved on. I went to uh, work in a hotel just after that. But I moved to London pretty fast. Okay. Um, as soon as soon as I got a um, a bit of bit of skill behind me, off to London, and that's when I just really enjoyed everything I was doing. It was just a different world. And where was your most favourite place to work in 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 London? Because I know that you've worked with some pretty amazing people. Yeah, I've worked with some really good guys. Um, but for me, Bruno Lube. Um, not just one place. I worked with him for six years in London and going from um, chef de party to his senior sous chef. And that whole time working in different restaurants with him was probably the best experience I've ever had. And that's probably wow. the biggest influence on my professional cooking. And what was the, what was, what type of cuisine were you trained in? What, what is your specialty? Um, so very grounded in, classical French very grounded in classical French I'm a really firm believer and we've got to learn the basics first before you can break the rules you know and that's that goes with anything really but yeah you really do have to learn the basics first before you can you know walk before you can run as such and do yeah. you still today put a lot of emphasis on the you know the respect of the traditional training uh yes I, I, I really believe a chef should be able to fillet the fish, you know, butcher, you know, not just a chicken, but a, a rabbit or a, a pig. 
and you know how to make a good sauce, how to make you know good ice creams, all the basic cornerstones of a good kitchen. In you know, a chef should be able to do you know to a reasonably good standard. And is that what then brings you to want to know more and more about the produce? Because you you really do champion local produce here in Australia. Yeah, um, for me, yeah, for me, working with uh, producers and seeing how hard they have it here in Australia, especially, and trying to reiterate that to the to the chefs in the kitchen, because when you're in the kitchen, you're, you're sort of caught up in the whole, you know, the whole vortex, and food comes in, food goes out, and it's quite easy to forget that connection. It's so important to have young chefs be able to go out to the farms, like with the guys, it's straight to the source, Tanya and, and Lucy, and to have that connection with uh, with suppliers is uh, it's gold. You can't you can't buy that. <laughs> Absolutely. It's incredible how much more you can appreciate, like you just said, you know, what our producers go through and mm -hmm. what and what the capabilities of certain produce is. Yeah, absolutely. And seasonality, etc. Um, and when you see the, you know, the quality, you know, that comes in into the kitchen, but when you go out to the farm and you see the hardship that they have, that like there's no water, there's, the ground is dry. Yeah, it's amazing that they can produce this quality, you know, for us to have. How lucky is that? No, I know, I totally that? agree yeah. with you. And so how did you come to have such a unique gift of understanding how to fuse the different flavours of food? This is a big question because... Yeah. So Bruno is... Even though he's classically, uh, he's, he's from Bordeaux, he's so classically French trained himself from the, from the French Navy. He, uh, he wanted to break barriers as well. So he, he would teach you to taste, taste something different. Taste, 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 always taste. And don't be scared to, to go outside of the comfort zone, go outside of the boundaries. So when I came to Australia, um, I worked with Bruno again up in Brisbane when he opened up his restaurant. And um, it was after a year and a bit up, up there that I came back to Sydney, I opened Atelier, and I was like, right, this is going to be, you know, just anything goes. It's going to be grounded in French technique, but I'm going to start to have a play around as well. Because being in Australia, you have so much more um, product, um, produce, flavors, um, international cuisines, all on your doorstep. And you'd be a fool not to you know because it's yeah. just all there and, it, and it's all delicious yeah but you're so you, a... you're incredible with the way that you really maximize your food costs like you, yeah. you create like, it's an incredible it's not, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's something that you have to work on of course it's not uh like every chef it just it just doesn't happen but you have to work but you have to utilize everything in the kitchen uh, i really hate wastage I like to use a lot of uh, pickles, ferments, all mm. these sort of things that will, once in season, when we work with suppliers and they have an abundance of daikon or an abundance of radishes or abundance of onions, we can start doing our processes in the kitchen. So when it comes to the time, you know, two months time, three months time down the line, we can start to introduce these into the kitchen and you know, your costs will start to come down because you're using pure seasonality. That's, that's the best way to do it. Yeah, but again, but zero, zero wastage. I hate wastage. I, I love that. I think that that's fantastic. And yeah. so, so give me an example of something that's really simple yet chefs don't think about when they're looking at food preparation that they could be saving money on. Um, so the basic skill of butchery. So buying in your, your carcasses, you know, slightly bigger than pre-packed you got a lot of even though you're paying for the trimmings as well but you're making sauces you're making stocks you you might get a, a family staff dinner out of that as well and your price has been reduced dramatically so just that basic time a little bit extra time a little bit extra effort just to go through your butchery for your, your fish prep all these little things that's where the money uh, that's where the gold is as well yeah for sure well, that carries your highest food cost doesn't it yep yeah, yes exactly but coming saying that as well you know good quality vegetables and fruits they're expensive as well. And I'd rather that money go straight to the producer than to Coles or Woolies. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, I totally, yeah. I totally hear you. And I think that that's, um, 
you know, one of the things that I really enjoy is to get out to the Flemington markets and, you know, I spend a couple of hours with Julio out there early in the morning yeah. and we get around and we talk to these producers and I, I kind of get the feeling that sometimes they wish that we didn't talk to the producers just because they, <laughs> you know, that they could just talk. Like they, it's yeah. like they haven't had human connection for quite a while. But well, that's their passion. You know, as soon as they see somebody who wants to talk about what they do, it all comes out. They spill out onto the onto the market floor with such, you know, it's like, yeah. And they want to, you know, taste this, look at this, try this, take this back. But that's what more chefs should do. They should go out and talk to these, you know, to these farmers. And, you know, it's a great benefit. It's a mutual benefit, you know, from a chef's point of view of learning about the product and from the producers or the farmer's point of view, they can get their product onto the plate as well. And that's a, it's a huge connection. And especially with the respect that the products deserve, you know, 100%. It's, it's one thing yeah. to cook a meal, but it's, a, it's another thing to actually treat it with the respect that the produce yeah, you sure. use deserves. So talk to me about texture. You know, one, mm -hmm. one thing I always have loved about your dishes is the texture. You just nail it every time. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah, look, when you compose a plate, you've got to think about every component that's on the if it's not If it's on the plate for no reason, then it shouldn't be there. So uh, everything has to have a good mouthfeel. Everything has to have um, deliciousness. Yeah, otherwise, I don't know. I, I can't really explain it, really. It's just something like, you just have to think it comes into the your mindset naturally when you're composing the plate. No, it's um it's it's definitely a strength of yours. Like I, I can I can just picture whenever I used to go to O Bar and just some of the dish the dish after dish that you used to serve up was just like, oh my God. Um yeah, but that comes down to quality of bread. produce. Yeah. Like yeah, even quality of produce. You make bread. Yeah. Well that was then, um trying to be more of like a because Michael had the, um, uh, he was a diabetic, we wanted to take bread away from the menu. So we, we came up with a, with a crisp bread. So all the seeds, we roast off all the seeds with uh, the roast and sea salt, and then run that through the crisp breads with, uh, with dill. And we serve that with, a, instead of a butter, we do a whipped ricotta. And yeah, so it's just another option, you know, another, another thing, instead of having the, the heaviness of bread, we were offering these like Scandinavian seeded crisp breads. It's pretty funky. Yeah, yeah that a lot of very beautiful. very time consuming, but it was pretty funky. The two hundred covers a night, yeah, <laughs> for sure. So when you came out to Australia, how long was it before you decided to open up your own restaurant? Um, so I came out on a one year working holiday visa, twenty one years ago, <laughs> and um, I spent the first year um, just like you know having a look around. I did six months up in Katoomba at Eccles Guest House. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, and when we were up there, we got a, a chef's hat. And like at the time, I didn't know anything about it. I had no idea what chef's hats were. I mean, it, it just seemed to happen. Um, then after that, uh, Bruno arrived in Queensland. He went up to he went up to uh, Brisbane for a year and a half. And yeah, at that point, it was like, well, it's time to do our own thing. It's time to open our own doors. And so I came back to Sydney where we had the support of uh, my ex-wife's uh, family as well. And yeah, opened up Atelier in King Street, Newtown when it was still very untrendy. Yeah. Um, next to and, the tattoo parlor. <laughs> that's what Atelier was. Yeah. So, so what does Atelier between, mean? Uh, so like, like a, an Atelier is like an artist it sounds quite conceited actually, but an artist studio or an artist workshop. Normally they're like situated in Paris beyond like the top floor of the, of the building, very cheap kind of like a um, studio where an artist could just paint or do his own thing. So that's when I saw, when I saw um, the shop down in King Street, I was like, this is like, this is perfect. It's very, very rustic. It's very tiny. Um, only could seat 28 people in one go. It was it was perfect. So uh, Atelier was like, this is it. And we were there, yeah, for 18 months before we got too big and we had to move the glebe because the demand was so high. Yeah. And well, then 11 years later. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you only see 28 people anyway, so it's not hard. <laughs> 
Well, some places um, don't even, they don't see, they can't even fill a restaurant for 28. So the fact yeah. that you did that and then had to look at a bigger premise is um, mm -hmm. is a testament. So how a lot of chefs when they come into the industry or, or just people in general think that opening up a restaurant is really easy. What would be your, what would be your advice on that? Yeah, that's what I thought as well. <laughs> I thought easy, just cooking cooking, serving, and you're actually taking the money for it now, you know? But then you realize, geez, man, um, you got the GST, you've got all the paperwork, you've got the, the payroll, you've got there's so much going on behind the scenes. And before you know it, yeah, the cooking is literally the easiest part. And then everything behind. So look, if you're going to open a restaurant now, do a lot of background research. I'm happy to talk about it if anybody wants to have a chat because there's a lot going on behind the scenes. So we used to do the five days at Atelier and then close on a Sunday, Monday. So Sunday would be the family time. And then Monday, back into the work, doing all the office work. And that would be a full a full day's work. You know, going in straight away, 9 a.m., 8 o'clock, and then finishing maybe 7, 8 o'clock at night. Get all the paperwork done, ready for, and all your orders ready for next week, and off you go again. It's just like so fast. That's just overwhelming, isn't it? Because... Like when you when you think about it and you say that cooking is actually the easiest part about owning a restaurant, that's incredible right. to me because by the time that you get to the cooking, did you find that you're exhausted or how do you keep that standard of food so high when you've got all this other noise going on around you? I think it's the, you, you're caught up on adrenaline as well because every dollar you you spend you have to make another three dollars or four dollars fifty to you know to pay your rent to pay your staff to pay the bills and then what's left at the end of it is what you have left which was never very much end of the week now i used to write down all my checks i'd be still using checks and uh <laughs> yeah i know this is just before like uh, um the online baking just started to come through then but i was still writing checks out um so i knew everyone was getting paid i knew you know I had control of what was going on. Uh, and yeah, but to have that uh, excitement, you know, to make sure that the guys that were coming in to work with you were, you know, were geared up for, you know, to learn, to see new things, to, to make sure that the customer um, uh, were having a great time when they, when they sat down for dinner. So yeah, it was, yeah, it was an excitement factor. The, the adrenaline just sort of like drags you through as well, you know, but cooking's cooking, cooking's good. And how important, how important was that recognition of winning the hats? Um, yes, look, from my point of view, when I came out here, um, I was an unknown quantity. You know, at the same time... I just can't was, imagine that. I actually just can't imagine that. No, it was nice. It was nice to come out and just, like, slip underneath the radar and you know at the same time when i opened atelier matt kemp opened balzac justin north had opened um uh, because uh, warren turnbull was around you know, all these you know really great chefs were out there doing you know some really good things and then there was just me in this like little dungeon of a restaurant in you know in you know the end of uh, newtown on king street that no one knew about and it was it was great you know matthew evans gave us a review and I think at the time, the only other customer in the restaurant was my mum. <laughs> when uh, when he reviewed us the first time, and then he came back a few days later, and we were busy, and he and then all of a sudden I get a phone call the following week, and he was asking me questions, and I was completely honest with him. And the following Tuesday, we we're in good food, and I was so nervous to open the paper, like. Uh, I was expecting, oh, if we get a 12 or a 13, I'll be really happy. It's a good foundation. You know, it's just the, yeah, the building block for the next thing. I opened the paper and we got a 15. And I was like, I can't say what I said. Because <laughs> all of a sudden, you, you, people's expectations are changing when they come into the restaurant. And that was a really big, a big turning, turning curve, yeah. a learning curve for us. Yeah. That's actually interesting because... Um, once you do start to have those awards and people start to know you for those awards, you do instantly have that standard, don't you, that you've got to keep yeah. living up to. So as a business owner, does that become harder or is that become more motivation? Yeah, 50-50. Um, for me, you know, because like you know, Matthew mentioned the, 
I think he called it a dog ugly ceiling, which uh, I, I never had any money to do anything about it. And uh, people would come into the restaurant and the first thing they do is look up and I'll be, I can see through the semi-open kitchen, everyone just looking at the, at the ceiling. I'd be like, oh, I've got to do something about this ceiling, <laughs> you know? And yeah, it's, it's a motivation and it's, you know, you have to, you know, have to pay attention to, to your customers. At the end of the day, when they came in, they were happy with, uh, with the service, with the food, with the, the ambience. Now it's the most important thing to stay focused on this do you think that if you had your restaurant today compared to when you had it back when you had it do you think that it would be um what would be the difference um oh, i don't know i think my food's become less complicated over the years okay um, which i think is a is a good thing i've really been able to is that a maturity understand. is that a maturity yeah. I, I hope so. <laughs> I like to think I'm starting to mature now at the riper age of nearly 50. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. I think the understanding the simplistic values of food, uh, you don't have to overwork anything so much. Yeah. Whereas before, yeah, even back in London, it was, it was a high um, over process of food. Nothing was just very simplistic and allowing the product to be the, the star. It was all worked into purees into paste and foams and all kinds of things so yeah keeping the keeping the produce real and alive is the most important thing so does that maybe go back to your point where you said before about where you um you've got this traditional french cuisine which you've got to understand before you start breaking the rules mm -hmm. and in this new maturity are you perhaps breaking the rules or are you still very much in that you have to be because French is like kind of overdone a bit isn't it yeah it, it can be but um you have in French as well I mean there's the building blocks of French cuisine but you also have like the, the nature side which was very much you know um in the 80s it was very on, on vogue you know and you know before the um you know, all the mousses and mousselines and purees and paste came through um yeah, the, the nature side of uh, of cooking is is was still there. Bruno was very much an influence on that as well. Um, he didn't care about the size or shape of things as long as it was cooked well. That was it. You, you treated it well. I think that's where it all stems back from, back to. Yeah, for sure. So when when did the Asian fusion come into it for you? Uh, here in Australia, yeah, it just opened my mind. You know, to all these different you know flavor bombs go different soys that I've never seen or tasted before. Now, obviously, we've had, you know, the, the basic uh, commodities back in the UK, but you don't have things that you see here, like rice paddy herb, uh, shizzle, uh, all, yeah, all the all the pastes, miso paste, especially for me, was a complete rabbit hole. And when you've got guys who are now making miso paste here in Australia, it's just fantastic. It's just an absolute just flavor depth, all flavor depth, yeah. And, and then you've got the molecular gastro gastronomy side as well, where you start mixing the science with food. How deep into that did you get? Yeah, I mean, it was that whole phase, you know, I think every chef went through it with uh, El Bully. And you, you start to realise after a while, you know, you're taking a, a beautiful piece of, uh, some beautiful ingredients like, like peas. You take some fresh garden peas, which are fantastic, you know. So clean, so fresh, so vibrant. Then you're boiling it, you're pureeing it, you turn it into a certification and you turn it into a pea again. <laughs> I'm like, oh, come on, that's, what's the point of this, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Just, like, have I got uh, nothing better to do with my day than to... Exactly, yeah. But whereas if you, and reconstruct if you, a pea. Yeah, if you just yeah, take the produce and, and treat it well and... Yeah, you don't have to do all this molecular stuff. There are a few ingredients that did come into you know, modern kitchens from this was like all the all the agars and vacuum gums, all these sort of like uh, um, new toolkits really for for modern kitchens, and they're they're pretty much staples now. But I think the whole molecular, sort of like a you know, certification, reverse certification in you know hot foams, in hot jellies, in that's yeah, it was fun. But end of the day, I don't think it has any sort of like longevity to it. So as chefs. Chef's lifestyle and, you know, just life in general can become quite overwhelming at times. What do you do to keep yourself balanced? Drink wine. 
um and that's okay like i know that you yeah. like to go out and explore new restaurants and stuff as well yeah, i love i love going out i think the whole you know i love to be on both sides of the coin i love to be you know in the kitchen and i love to be sat at the table as well i love to see a restaurant in full swing you know i love to see you know the front of house absolutely smashing it you know and it's just it's so good it's so good to see um that's one of my biggest um relaxation is is going to see other restaurants is something that you can't do right now and probably i've cooked more at home in the last year than i have in my entire life that's 100 percent with all these lockdowns and you have to but yeah it's it's quite funny how you know when you're cooking at home and you don't have you know you don't have a little bit of sauce here or that extra bit of seasoning from there and then you realize i'm not that good <laughs> <laughs> you're starting to cook you're starting to go back to your mom that's right, yeah. Asking her for a recipe for Yorkshire puddings. <laughs> <laughs> so during the lockdown pro period and, you know, we do try to look for our for comforts, you know. We're, we're out of our comfort zone, so we're trying to cling on to as many comforts as we can. What are some of your comfort foods? Like what is it that you enjoy to eat? Oh, are you like a lazy? Really. Are you a lazy cook, or are you actually a, like you? You put a bit of time and effort in. Um, fifty fifty. It depends. Um, when I'm at home, you know, I try to be as simplistic as possible. Um, I've learnt not to use every pot and pan now because I have to. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Because you know, nothing worse than spending another forty five minutes after cleaning up in and scrubbing your pots and pans all day long. Um, I mean, I have no issue doing that in the kitchen, and I've done it very often. But when, when you're at home, it's just a different kettle of fish. So I, I learned now to, I can make a meal with just one pan and various dishes. So I got that down to a fine art. <laughs> that is so funny. What's your favourite ingredient? What is the one ingredient that you could um, you could not live without? Uh, look. I can't, there's no way I can narrow that down to one ingredient. I mean, I love so many things. Um, I can't, it's impossible. I mean, I love, you know, Australian beef is some of the best beef in the world. You know, the lamb here is absolutely amazing. Seafood here is fantastic. And now we're, you know, with the price of lobsters, you know, everyone can afford, you know, a lobster, you know, and how good's that? How lucky are we for that? You know, you know, $38 for, for a lobster, amazing. Life. It is amazing. We're yeah. actually having that for Father's Day this year. Yeah, what a great special occasion. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah, so now I couldn't pinpoint one one ingredient. There's two. No. If I took just one, I'd miss something else straight away. So as a father in this industry, how do you mm -hmm. make sure that you spend time with your children? Because you've got all girls. Yeah. And they they love their, their they love their dad obviously and um, you love you adore your girls. What, Absolutely. What do you do to make sure that you spend the quality time with them? Well, now they're teenagers, it's harder. They have you know busier social lives than I've ever had. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, it's just being there, always being on call for them as well. You know, so I try to allocate every Sunday is a one hundred percent given. Um, but yeah, it's always just being on the end of the phone at any other time. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, it's tough. I mean, because we're separated as well. You know, I don't live with them. So it's harder in, in that respect. But yeah, just to always have that communication open. Any any problems, any issues, or just to say hi, you know, always there. I love that. It, yeah. And are any of them going to go into uh, food world, do you think? Are there any of them interested in hospitality or food service? Yeah, well, Kate's my eldest. She... Um, She's so she started working with me at O Bar, and then she followed me up to the tower to Bar Eighty Three, and now she's working for a company in in Leichhardt doing, um, oh, like uh, event management. So she's oh, more wow. into the into event management now, which is fantastic. She's loving it. That's so good. So when you were up at O Bar, mm -hmm. did you ever get like motion sickness? No, but um, some people did. Yeah, I I never got it myself, um, but Obar was a it's a big restaurant. It was a really big restaurant, even though it's it's turning around. It's not like a, a waltzers in the <laughs> at the fairground. It's it's a really slow, even motion. Um, but yeah, I knew a few customers that would 
you know, have to you know, move around so they couldn't see the windows from from sliding about. Yeah, in the kitchen. it's interesting. Yeah, <laughs> uh, in in the kitchen, I you work inside the kitchen. You could be anywhere. You could be on. But the did the tower floor. never move at all? Um, Sydney Tower, Westfield Tower, yes. So you could feel the wind up up there. There's Sorry, a few times. Up top yeah. of the Sydney Tower, yeah. Yeah, you can feel the wind. There's a few times the um, the elevators didn't work and we had to walk down the stairs, 82 floors. Yeah. That's just shocking. Yeah. By the time I got to the bottom, my legs were like jelly. All the young guys and girls, they're just running down the stairs like gazelles. <laughs> and then I get to the bottom and my legs are like, like, like jelly just at the bottom. <laughs> so how did your suppliers go with, with, pro like with your products and having to get it up there if your lips were out? Yeah, look, it's interesting times because um, if we don't have our product early in the morning, because we all go upstairs at 11 o'clock, then you don't have that product then until probably tomorrow, you know, because you're not going to be going down all the time because it's a long way. If you send someone down, that's 20 minutes. That's gone, mm. you know. So, yeah, you've got to really work ahead, make sure that you've got your product ready on a day-to-day -day basis before 11 a.m. And anything that gets returned or is missing, then you don't have it. So it was yeah communication was definitely the key so what's going on with darren templeman today what are you doing um so about to open botswana butchery that's going to be in the mlc center in martin place oh wow um, but yeah that's going to be very exciting it's called it's called botswana butchery but it's going to have three different levels so on the ground floor we're going to have um uh, oyster bar, crustacean bar, um, a dry aging room, and a cheese room as well. Uh, on the on the second floor, we're going to have um, like the the grill, the steakhouse, restaurant, and on the top, we're going to have a rooftop bar. So there's a lot of things going to be happening on the venue, which is pretty exciting. That's super exciting. Yeah, it's going to be a big venue, and it's going to be really cool. Can't wait. So. You're going to have like a little bit of a mix of everything. So why Botswana? What? Why did you? What? What? Where did that name come from? Um, so the owners, because uh, they're a good group, they have uh, restaurants over in New Zealand as well. So they have Botswana Butchery. Um, I believe the name came from um, one of the original chefs back oh, in okay. uh, in Queenstown, yeah, uh, years ago. So yeah, they've carried that on um, throughout as a brand, and yeah, they're doing one here in Sydney and one in Melbourne as well this year. That's super exciting. Yeah, it's really cool. Uh, again, a great opportunity to showcase some of the best produce and producers that we have here in Australia. Uh, like I say, the, you know, for me, Australian beef is some of the best in the world, along with the lamb. Yeah, you know, like I'm, I can't wait. I'm super excited. What's going to be your favourite cut that you're going to have on the menu? Uh, I'm a big flank. Yeah. Fan. I love flank, hanger steak. Yeah. But again, you know, utilising uh, as much of the animal as possible, 100%. I love the hanger steak as well. Oh, mm. my goodness. When, yeah, um, the fla the flavour is just the texture. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, I, I, I'm totally on board with that. And we don't see enough of it on menus, you know, like. That's right, yeah. Um, I just wonder whether that's because of skill or whether that's because of uh, they just don't think to do it or they don't know how to really cook it properly. Yeah, well, that as well. Um, I mean, it's, it's a fibrous piece of meat. You, you really have to leave it to rest for a while to get the most out of it and cook it nice and rare. Um, but you know, customers, they, they, I mean, there's nothing wrong with going for the tenderloin. I just find that a little bit, you know, boring. predictable and a bit, bit boring. Yeah, absolutely. Because for your rest of the beast, you have such amazing cuts and amazing, amazing flavors and textures. So yeah, hopefully we can try, you know, try and swing that around. That'd be good. I love the way that you've stuck with modern Australian cooking Whereas a lot of other chefs have kind of gone more that polished casual or they've even got into like burger um, businesses now. And there's nothing wrong with that. But Not I sure. love the fact that you've stayed with what it is that you love to do. Yeah. End of the day, I love going to restaurants. I love sitting down and having a great experience and a great time. Um, yeah. I hope, that, you know, hopefully I can, you know, give that up, you know, that, um, to everybody else as well. That's the main thing doing what you love 
Have you been to the Crown? Did you have you been down there and checked out the restaurants? Absolutely, yeah. Of course, it's you have to. <laughs> no. uh, look, look, the Crown. I mean, the money they throw around down the Crown is you know, it's casino based. Look, it's a casino right now, without any machines. <laughs> yeah, but is that sustainable? We'll, we'll have to wait and see. I mean, I wish all the guys down there good luck, but uh, yeah, wait and see. So the whole you... the whole game is changing. In what way? Um, no tourists. Now we're, yeah. we're all fighting. We're all fighting for the same dollar because everyone's like we're all landlocked now. We can't go anywhere. Um, people, are, you know, who are lucky enough to be working from home uh, are still getting their, their their paychecks every week. They're not going. They're not spending that on overseas trips. So the competition for the dollar now in in Sydney in the metropolitan area is super fierce so you i think customers can be a bit more discerning as well they can see the value for money where it is and where it isn't so yeah it's you really have to be pretty smart operator now i do really hope that when we come out of this lockdown that uh we 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 go back into the city and we start to enjoy what the city has to offer yeah it's going to take a time you know it will take time um I think with the new ventures that are opening, there's a few other new restaurants opening around the same area of the CBD. Um, that will create a nice buzz. And again, just to go out and just enjoy what the best of what Australia has to offer, you know, is how good's this, you know? Sit down at a nice, you know, a nice sunny, warm, balmy yeah. spring, summer evening. Beautiful. Do you know what I've always said that I wanted to do that I have never done in Sydney is jump on the red bus, the double-decker bus, and do the, the tourist tour. All right, okay. And as soon as we come yeah. out of this, I am going to do I'm it. going to do it, yeah. Uh, I did the, um, uh, the Harbour Bridge climb a few years back and one of my daughter's roles, she wants to do it, so we'll, we'll do that again. That'd be fantastic. But I, I walk around the CBD all the time, you know, but not so much now, but, you know, before COVID, I was always walking around. And I prefer to walk around because I think you get a real feel of the city, you know, you can see all different areas of the CBD and it's, it's a beautiful city. It's such a nice place. We are very, very fortunate. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think in Australia, just in general, we're so fortunate. I don't think it matters where you go you find something beautiful about every state and territory that we have. Yes, for sure. And even just not far away, you know, just a couple hours drive and you've got a completely different, you know, mm. a different landscape. Absolutely. So how have you been spending your time in lockdown? What have you been up to? Oh, with the new restaurant, there's plenty of food costing and supplier connection. There's a lot of things happening, you know, behind the scenes. And it's a great, to be honest, it's a great time to do it now whilst I have the time because once the restaurant opens, you know, all these things, you know, they take a lot of time and effort to, to do. So, yeah, once you build up all these, you know, all your connections, all the costumes are in place, and then we can start to concentrate on the cooking, which would be, yeah. So having to do that now in lockdown is a good time. Yeah, that, that's that's a good use of your time and it keeps you yeah. um, busy and, and, and keeps you connecting and having conversations, right? Absolutely. And connecting to the chefs as well. I mean, I, I know a lot of chefs, you know, from a mobile, from, from the tower, you know, and new chefs I'll be taking on board when, uh, when the restaurant opens and staying connected to everybody, you know. And like you're know, talking to the guys down at Borough Bar where they're doing the, the food for, for hospitality, you know, keeping... Yeah, the whole, yeah, the whole connection thing going. I mean, I love what Chow and Bryce are doing down there, and it's just such a heartwarming, yeah, such a beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing. What made you so passionate about what it is that they're doing, and and just for everyone else's benefit? So, Burrow Bar is um, it, it's a bar in the city in um, Clarence Street, and yep. Chow and Bryce opened it just on lockdown, just when we were going into lockdown and um, they didn't want to get rid of their staff and they also wanted to do something that would support our industry to help the hospitality workers to be able to have a good nutritious meal um, rather than worrying about not eating because even though with the government um, giving us, you know, giving us money, it's not enough to cover rent and, and everything else. So they're actually um, doing all these meals. 
yeah and i just like reached out to them because i know bryce and chow from before and i said any help you need just give me a shout you know i'm around so they said oh can you come down and give us a hand on sunday i oh, sorry on saturday um just going back of maybe six weeks or so now and uh i went down we we did a did a meal with all the stuff that we had you know and we, you know, the guys are running out to, to supermarkets and to shops to buy ingredients and i'm like wow these guys are you know they're, they're, they're putting into their own pockets here to and they're doing it on a daily basis you know and then we did them we did the packages all the 200 meals are ready to go there's a queue outside of people all all different walks of life uh, waiting to have food then all the packages were going out to different venues to be picked up around the CBD, around the city. Uh, and for me, I was just like, wow, you know, this is like amazing, absolutely amazing. I'm very, um, I felt sad as well. Like, you know, these guys are, are working so hard to not only keep their business online, but they're, they're also happy to, to produce for, for everybody else. So, so that's when I reached out to you guys as well and said, can you help me? And the help that you guys, especially you Vanessa was amazing we are I was blown away I'm look I was away. just happy to be able to um provide a platform for people to be able to feel like they were contributing and I'm yeah. just fortunate that I have a partner that's very clever when it comes to um tech space <laughs> you can create a website like literally within an hour and yeah, it's cool. we, yeah so it feels very clever and um you know we just put up food bags that people could purchase that would raise yeah. money to go towards um, what what Bryce and Chow are doing. Because the last yeah. thing we want is at the moment supply chain to also be putting their hand in their pocket, given that mm. they're going through such a tough time as well. And yeah. God love them. I mean, so many of them donated. You know, you just put the call out and there was product yeah. coming from everywhere. Mm. But you know, then when the announcement came that we, we were still another six weeks out of, you know, before we were looking like coming out of the lockdown, it's like, this is not sustainable. And um, to date, we've raised, you know, $4,300 and yeah, that's amazing. now paying for the produce, which is just, yeah. it's just incredible, you know? Yeah, I was just like blown away. And I'm sure Bryce and, uh, and Chow was as well. But yeah, it was just like, whoa how amazing is this and now i think they're doing like 3,800 a week now uh meals which is amazing it's just incredible to think that yeah. you know how how t I, I look i don't want to go down that rabbit hole because you know we're trying to keep it um really inspirational and very yeah. um you know but the reality is our industry is just doing it really tough at the moment and i just yeah. think wherever we can support each other you know yeah like a sprinkle of magic here and there goes a long way. Absolutely. You know, and everyone's yeah. trying to do something. I'm, you know, yeah. I, we talk about resilience and all the rest of it. And you look at what some of these chefs that have been stood down that have lost their income, that what they're doing, other places are loaning out their commercial kitchen so that people are able to do these grazing pack packs and all the rest of it. You've got small producers coming out and uh, like, I don't know, it's just been really wonderful to see what can be achieved during a yeah, time of sure. crisis. Mm -hmm. no, it's but really anyway, crazy. that's um, and, that, and that's kind of what I think has strengthened the connection and the relationship in, with people is that, yeah. like you said before, we're, we are all there for each other. Yeah, for sure. Has it, made, has it surprised you just how much um, support there is out there for, for everyone? Uh, oh, absolutely. Um, yes and no, because I know hospitality very much uh, like a one love community um there's no uh, there's no i don't know you can't say um yeah everyone's in it together and we always have been you know it's you know if someone's calling out need a chef they've got a chef missing or a chef sick or something then you you lend chefs around you know, that's always been our sort of a case within, within sydney anyway um no one's left standing by themselves uh, but yeah, when this, yeah, when lockdown happened again and it, it's starting to just drag on now, yeah, the fact that there's so many people out there helping so many other people, which is just fantastic. It, it, no, it didn't surprise me, but it's so good to see, you know, it really is yeah. good to see. That's actually a nice um, analogy because 
It hasn't surprised me, but it's been really nice to see. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we've never really had to lean into it too much, have we? Yeah, that's right, exactly. And, and yeah. to test that. So tell me, in terms of inspirational um, people that, that have been kind of role models through your career, who, who would be those people? Cool. I say people because it's too hard to just have one, right? Like, yeah. I mean, we have like my mom, role models at all times, yeah. or mentors, if you like. Yeah, my mum, obviously, in my that. very early I love days. Tammy. Yeah, yeah, for sure, 100%. I mean, she makes you, you know, the person that you are, you know, end of the day. So you can blame her. <laughs> I'll, <laughs> thank blame. Her. I'll thank her. I'll thank her. I think you're amazing. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, but yeah, chef wise, you know, Bruno was uh, was the biggest, um, one hundred percent. I had when I went to Singapore and I worked with Narasawa from Japan. That was like a light bulb moment as well, where you, know, you start to realise different flavours and textures um, that you've never seen before, and it was just really that was new to me. Um, but biggest inspiration for me now is the guys and girls I'm working with. You know, I love to be challenged. I love to have them to challenge me and say, you know, can we do this? Can we do that? You know, how, how to do this? Let's try this. That's what, that's what I love, you know? And like, you know, I'm, I'm the oldest guy in the kitchen by a country mile, but I love to have guys in there who can still challenge me as well. And I, that's, what, that's the only way I'd have it. That's, the, that's where the inspiration comes from now is the guys coming through the kitchen. I love that. I love that. And do you know why I love that? On the Are You OK webinar today, it's like, you know, what can we be doing to, um, in, you know, to inspire our next generation and to, to keep them enthused? And you've just nailed it. And I, I had the thought when we're on this webinar today, learn from them. Yeah, for sure. They, can they see learn. through fresh eyes. Yeah. You know, look, I'd love to know how to do reels on social media, you know, like, these kids know the ins and outs of all the technology. They they see the world in a very different way to how we've seen it. And yeah, for sure. there's some shared learnings there. And if you um you really just start, if we really start to show them that we appreciate the way that they think and what they can teach us, mm -hmm. maybe we, yes. we we will be able to keep these guys close. Absolutely. Yeah, and I don't believe that a chef has to be, you know, always moving around for, you know, different venues. If you, have a, if you work in a good kitchen with a good group of chefs and you're always learning and you're still progressing, you don't have to move anywhere. Just not just for your CV, hone your craft, hone your skill set, and that's the best thing you can do. And uh, thank you so much. And thank you for, you know, teaching your craft to the next generation because, you know, you've turned out some amazing chefs and some amazing humans as well. Like you're not just teaching them about like their skills and their training. You're actually teaching them how to be a decent person. And yeah, I think that that's <laughs> something to be really admired. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. And thank you very much. And I can't believe that we've just been chatting for a whole hour. I know it's flown by. <laughs> You know when you go and have a massage done and the minute that you sit in there for the massage, you think, okay, that's a minute. Like, I'm going to sit yeah. back and really enjoy this now because it's going to be over before I know it. Before you know it, yeah. <laughs> that's how I find these conversations. It's like, okay, I don't have time to pussyfoot around. I just want to get straight in there and start having a conversation. <laughs> but thank you so much. It's been a, it's been a thrill. I've loved, um, you. loved seeing you and talking to you. Yep, it's great to see you again. Always and I hope um, everyone else that's online has enjoyed it as well. Cool. Thanks, guys. Kind of forget that they're there, right? <laughs> that's right. Yeah, I know. I had, I had to curtail my swearing as well. <laughs> you don't have to do that. We're, we're, we're all in good company. <laughs> all right. Well, stay safe, stay good, stay well, and much. stay positive, and we'll um, catch up soon. Absolutely. That's I can't a, wait to see you. Uh, I can't wait to see Botswana come to life. It's pretty exciting. Yeah. Soon, hope, as soon as we get out of lockdown, we can start moving forward fast. It'd be cool. Awesome. Thank you so much, Darren. Thank you. Lots of Chat love. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.